you suddenly the oil price can be 60 or 40 in your face with just a relatively minor switch. And if it wasn't for the Saudis holding back a million barrels a day of their own capacity right now, voluntarily, we would be below 60. I'm sure of it. Forward Guidance is brought to you by Vanek, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about Vanek ETFs later on. But for now, let's get into today's interview. Very happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Paul Sankey of Sankey Research. Paul, great to see you. How are you doing? Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, Paul. You're an expert in the oil business. The price of oil is incredibly important to macro. You know, when the price of oil shot up to $120, that's what caused inflation to go to to 9%. And oil is the fastest moving thing. You know, demographics is not going to cause a huge CPI shock in, in any any month. What is your outlook on the price of oil right now? And how do you think the blend of supply and demand will shape out uh, over the next year? Well, we feel like we're in an equilibrium at about $80 Brent right now, which is at a seasonally weak time. February is pretty weak. And we do have a significant turnaround season for the refining industry in the U.S., which will tend to weaken demand for oil. But the overall market is in equilibrium. The problem with that is that Saudi has cut back a million barrels a day of production for us to be in equilibrium. So essentially, it's hard to get too bullish as long as Saudi's carrying a good couple of million of barrels a day of spare capacity, because obviously, if the market begins to tighten, then Saudi can simply increase production. So they're at about 9 million barrels a day right now. And we think their capacity the observed capacity is 11.8 million barrels a day, which they actually hit in the depths of COVID, believe it or not, when they were in a market share war. And of course, oil prices went negative. At the, mo- at the moment, Saudi's very responsibly acting as the central bank of oil. And so the 80 looks like a good price. And what, ex- what excites us about that is that it's a very good price for the big oils. So they're generating all-time record returns to shareholders as we speak. So this quarter results were an all-time record for Exxon Chevron. BP Total Shell combined Conoco Phillips in terms of dividends and cash returns, which are approaching 10% annually. So we we love that. The negatives are natural gas is looking rough. This hasn't been a super warm winter. It's been basically normalish. And natural gas is is really suffering. And one of our lines has been that, that Saudi cuts a, a bearish US natural gas because Saudi encourages more activity in US exploration and production by raising prices. And the associated natural gas that comes with that activity in the US oversupplies the US gas market. So gas looks rough. We need to cut spending. We need to reduce supply. So we don't like service companies. But all of this volume, all-time record volumes in US production means that we're bullish on midstream. So we like all the uh, typically known as MLPs, but basically pipeline companies such as energy transfer in gas or enterprise in in NGLs or Plains All-American in oil. We like all those guys too. And then finally, as you noted, there's a lot of interest around power and and AI consumption for power. But we're just observing that as energy market observers, as opposed to recommending utility stocks. So the fact that you said you think oil can be range bound, sounds like you are moderately bullish on the price of oil, but you don't expect any big jumps. So from a macro standpoint, that sounds like the inflationary pressure might be a little bit muted. In other, not that it won't be an inflationary pressure, but that it will be, you know, the risk of a upside shock to inflation. And I mean, a true shock is somewhat lower. Just want to find when you talk about refining, that's basically turning crude oil into the various products. And then spare capacity is how much capacity they can you know, quickly turn online. We're talking about Saudi Arabia. Tell us a bit more out of your outlook on, on supply. So basically, we do think that gasoline prices, so pump prices, and that's you know, a consumer confidence issue as much as anything. We think those will be under upward pressure here going into Memorial Day, so for the next two or three months, because there's a lot of refining turnaround. So we think demand for crude will be weak because the refineries are not running. But production of product will also be tight as a result of that. And so gasoline prices, we think, can go up. Will they get to the trigger point for U.S. consumers, which is a good 25 to 30 percent above where we are today, which would be more like four dollars plus nationwide gasoline? I don't see that as being, you know, the refining turnaround season is, is a normal event, essentially. So it'll tighten the market, but it's not a crisis event. As you reference, you, you, at the moment, the price has structurally moved higher on Russia-Ukraine, but that's unlikely to happen again. 
at that scale. So there's a lot of risk already baked in the oil market. So broadly speaking, oil looks fairly tempered here from the point of view of another major inflation risk. People are excited about Venezuela at the moment, but we don't see anything actually real actually happening between Venezuela and Guyana, not least because it's an election year and the administration is going to be keeping a very close eye on oil prices. So that's another issue that's kind of bearish oil. So that's that's some, just some more back, backdrop. On the supply side, you know, that we still, still see solid growth in the US this year, which has been the single biggest driver of the supply side of oil. Uh, it had a remarkable US production growth was remarkable last year. It broke all expectations coming in at about a million and a half barrels a day of incremental supply from US producers, which is staggering. But we don't expect anything like that growth this year, more like half a million barrels a day. Keeping in mind that a strong year for global demand growth is over a million barrels a day. US growth alone last year exceeded global oil demand growth. So that was obviously pretty bearish and is why the Saudis have had to cut back production. On the demand side, you know, Jack, you're the economic expert, you tell me, but this economy, I remember last time I was on, which is probably at least six months ago, we were talking about the recession that never comes. Mm -hmm. It never, it hasn't come. I mean, it's amazing, right? And, um, you know, the strength of the US economy has been quite remarkable. The, the Q3 number was staggering, you know, over 5% GDP growth from economy of this size, and not least thanks to booming oil and gas production, actually, which of course is primary economic activity. And so very bullish for the US economy to have Texas so strong as it is. You know, again, the market looks quite well set up. I think we came in this year thinking to people are too bullish the wider market and too bearish oil here because the oils are actually doing very well. The industry is consolidating. And so our expectation was in a reversal of 2023, people came in bearish the S&P and bullish oil, and they were wrong. This year, they expect, and that was a continuation of 2022. This year, somehow the, they've reversed and expect a continuation of 23 into 24. And our argument is actually inflation is going to stay high. It'll be relatively bullish oil, and the market will probably come off whatever high Nvidia sets with its results next week, but we'll see. It's uh, it's it's certainly lively out there, and momentum is very positive for the market and negative for the oils. Paul, what's it like as an oil analyst who grew up basically calling people and getting basically you know inside people to track how much oil is in the tanker, and you know using drones to to find out all this information about oil. What's it like, you know, paying attention to NVIDIA's results? Like, I, I imagine this is probably the first time in your career you've been paying attention to the semiconductor industry as a serious effect for the oil market. Yeah, I think what, what the clients complain about is the fact that we all have to listen to the Fed commentary, uh, you know, pause the results and everything else. I mean, back in the day, I worked at Deutsche Bank, and we had a guy that would yell, you know, through the hoot and holler what the Fed was doing, and everyone would pay attention for like three minutes and then move on to something else. Now, even oil specialists have to listen to the entire Powell press conference. So there's that. The oil industry's biggest traded commodity in the world, biggest, really the biggest physical market in the world, and if anything. And so the amount of data available is, is enormous. And there's a lot of people spending a lot of time worrying about this stuff at any given level. But the big picture is boils down to a very simple balance between how much is global oil demand going to grow this year. It's going to be somewhere around a million barrels a day in any given year. Uh, it could contract with COVID, but you know the range is is not that great. Uh, and then, of course, the supply side is really what's the Saudi? What are the Saudis doing? And how much growth is there in the U.S.? The the actual moving parts are relatively limited. The challenges that because everything is set at the margin, a very small change in that marginal balance between supply and demand, with the industry being so efficient and running such low inventories as a rule. You suddenly the oil price can be 60 or 40 in your face with just a relatively minor switch. And if it wasn't for the Saudis holding back a million barrels a day of their own capacity right now, voluntarily, we would be below 60. I'm sure of it. So, you know, it's, it, it, is, it is tough, but it's endlessly fascinating. So in the same way, maybe that you know, the entire global economy is resting on whether the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates or not, the entire global economy if the global oil market is resting on what Saudi Arabia does, what's your outlook on whether they will continue to cut production or they will they maintain that? In other words, they won't increase uh, capacity and say, hey, you know, 80 bucks price of oil, we're making a bunch of money and we're you know piling a lot of money into venture capital and that requires more money. Let's let's pump. Let's increase capacity. 
Yeah, Jack, it's not surprising you have a successful podcast. You ask good questions. Yeah, you know, I've always said if 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 you wanted me to call the oil price with just one piece of information, it would be the last statement of the Saudi oil minister. So yeah, they're absolutely crucial. They are known as the central bank of oil. And they have, you know, probably, I think, a $95 aspiration for oil prices, which is where they have excess cash flow relative to their spending. They have a lot of spending, but they balance the budget with very, very little debt, relatively speaking, in Saudi at, at a country level. Uh, they balance the budget probably at around 80. So they're holding oil at a level that they don't love. They would prefer it to be 95. But, you know, as I said, it is an equilibrium price. And the math for them is simply out of 10 million barrels a day, let's say normalized production and them now producing nine, does 10% less supply get them an oil price that's 20% higher, in which case they're in the money. And the answer right now is yes. But if some of their nemesis, nemesi, such as Iran and Russia, continue to take their market share, we have highlighted that there's a significant downside tail event, which would be Saudi gets tired of losing market share that it could be producing from its own barrels, but watches Iran through sanctions busting and Russia too, for that matter, but Russia also busting their OPEC plus agreement. They could get to the point, and they've done it in the past in 2014, notably, where they say, you know what, we're going to take all of you down and regain our market share. And that that would be more like a $40 oil price scenario. And we had highlighted that as a risk for 2024 late last year, and it got a lot of attention. At the moment, I think the global economy is strong enough and demand is strong enough. And Iran is kind of in a box at the moment that they're probably not not in the mood to really cause problems for the global oil market because they're getting frustrated with other actors' behavior. It just feels like we're balanced at the moment. But it's definitely one to watch is how much oil is Iran selling to China? How much export is Russia exporting against their agreements? And how furious is Saudi about that? At the moment, I would say that the furyometer is quite low. I would say it's below five out of 10. But like the State Department in Venezuela, they're watching very closely. So you think the risk of Saudis increasing production overnight is also somewhat of a low risk. Obviously, anything's possible, but well, there's a short-term risk, you think it's somewhat low. Yeah. I mean, they first did it in 86. They got very frustrated by the growth of non-OPEC while they were taking production down as low as two and a half million barrels a day, believe it or not. So they had 7 million barrels a day of spare capacity back then, and they opened the taps. That took oil down to under $10 a barrel, believe it or not, in the 80s. Uh, but most recently in 2014, yeah, they they absolutely opened the taps. And of course, in 2020, they got in a dispute with Russia and really opened the taps, and that sent oil prices negative. So you got to watch what the Saudis are doing and how upset they are pretty closely if you want to be you know, aware of risk to the downside in oil. At the moment, they're holding the market together very effectively. Thanks for that. Paul, tell us about American production. I know it's been up, and I believe it's at record levels, but how much has it gone up and how much is the increase in oil over expectations what you know you and other professional oil folks were were forecasting i might you know as a market observer compare that to oh the the you know the yesteryear of 2022 when oil ceos and you know oil stock analysts were going on tv talking about how oil ceos had found religion and they're never they're never going to drill another well all the money is going to go back to shareholders with dividends and buybacks and debt paydowns and, you know, looks like they have drilled a little bit more well. So you you got the numbers. Tell us about the, the numbers and your thoughts on it. Well, listen, from a macro point of view, this is the most staggering thing. In 2008, we were importing about 13 million barrels a day of oil, right, into the U.S. And obviously, that has huge implications for the dollar, for the current account balance, balance of trade, everything else, strength of the U.S. economy, you name it. And, of course, all those dollars are getting exported to places let's say, you know, that you don't necessarily like Venezuela, you don't necessarily want to send your money to. But what we've seen over the past 10 years, 15 years has been this absolutely staggering success of the US horizontal drilling and fracking movement, let's call it, which has unleashed this incredible growth in US production and directly reduced our imports so that we're now a net exporter of 2 million barrels a day of oil. So we've had a 15 million barrel a day, you know, call it, $80 a barrel swing in our position globally. And as as I was talking to clients about Venezuela today, we've also seen a total shift in global geopolitics because of the US position. And it's not only in oil, we also went from zero LNG exports in 2016, as recently as 2016, to be the biggest LNG exporter in the world. So it's been an absolutely staggering success story for the industry that 
it doesn't get the credit it deserves for being such a powerful part of the US success story here. That's my preaching. At the moment, we did about an incredible 1.5 million barrels a day of growth last year in the US, as I said, which took us to 13 million barrels a day. So these are staggering numbers and made us, by the way, the largest oil and gas producer in the world. Saudi's the largest exporter, of course, just be aware of that. You know, in the process, we're now looking at probably about half a million barrels a day of further growth in the US this year. And that's absolutely key for future balances of oil, because when the US goes into decline, that will be when we have another major bull run in oil to its next level, whatever that may be, depending on when US productivity genuinely begins to decline. Because last year, we saw less rigs, less frack crews produce more oil. So productivity is clearly rising, which is clearly bearish prices, and has essentially forced the Saudis to step in to stop prices from going down to the marginal cost of US supply, which is $60 a barrel. So that's the natural pressure. As long as Saudi's holding us up, we're at more like 80. The over under on that 500 is under debate at the moment as we go through full year results here for the companies. You have some very few companies that haven't got religion. We're talking about Comstock today still drilling despite gas prices heading towards $1 per MMBTU or $6 a barrel of oil equivalent, believe it or not which is obviously also bullish for the US economy and bearish positively for inflation. You know, what we're seeing here is definitely the, some capital discipline from some big players, for example, Diamond Back buying Endeavor this week, have said that their production will be basically flat. So they're not growing. Uh, that's more or less the pattern across the industry. And a couple of companies like Chevron have said, actually, their first half supply will actually decline. So long story short, the I, the, the production outlook is a step lower, significant step lower in growth this year for the US, which helps global oil balances, and possibly no growth in 2025. Although there's still some lagging growth in places like the Gulf of Mexico that will probably keep us positive for a couple more years. And the natural tendency with oil at 80 is for the US to keep growing. It really needs to be close to $60 oil for us to really see balance sheets deteriorating and capex need a further cut. So at the moment, we're balanced, basically. And gro growth is slowing, but still positive. So who's doing all the drilling? If, if you know, Chevron is production going to be flat, Diamondback is going to be flat. I know they just did a big deal that, that you're excited about. They, so you're saying they have been growing, but they're just not going to grow as much in the future? Yeah, exactly. So essentially, their, their activity remains sustained because you have to constantly fight the decline rates. That's the other interesting thing about US fracked production is it has enormously high decline rates. So essentially, they're tempering their activity at the margin, but they're still they're still drilling and they're still fracking. Uh, they have to to meet all their targets because they will have quite aggressive targets. One of the strange things at the moment is that Exxon and Chevron are actually showing strong growth. Now, of course, a very big part of that, the majority of that is from acquisitions. But the companies are in quite aggressive growth mode, um, which obviously is you know not typical of, of Exxon and Chevron. But we're in a M&A cycle. And so these companies are going to be structurally much bigger. A company like Diamondback was 80,000 barrels a day in 2017. It's going to 800,000 barrels a day. So some of these guys are really getting big. And with the bigger activity, are going to be much more efficient tends to be bearish through oil prices, but it's bullish for shareholders because of the free cash flow they're going to generate. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low-cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more. That's vanek.com slash hodlfg. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you can lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Tell us about the mergers and acquisitions M&A cycle that we've been in. When did it start? Was the catalyst for it just bullish oil prices? And what have you made of the various deals? I know Exxon did a deal, maybe Chevron did a deal. You know, Give us kind of your, your personal thoughts on whether they were good deals or bad deals. I take it also that you think the, the Diamondback deal was a good deal. Yeah, we liked all the deals and we, we've changed our view from five years ago. Five years ago, we had the renaissance thesis of US EMP, which was that these companies have to get religion, as you mentioned, on cutting capex and generating free cash flows. They have to return 
more money to shareholders in the context of better overall returns. And they've done that. But of course, a major part of that was always going to be consolidation. We originally saw this with the US refining industry. You know, you had too many refiners spending too much money. And from 2010 onwards, that industry massively consolidated. And the companies now make fabulous returns. It was certainly relative to refining's history. Volatile, but, but, but great. And it, we've seen a similar thing in oil, where many of these companies simply weren't delivering the kind of returns that made, you know, that justified the existence of the companies. You know, I mean, they just had terrible returns. And, um, you know, we needed them to be handed over to the best managed companies. Companies such as Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, Diamondback are very, very well run. You know, they're superb companies. And some of the other guys that were sort of crashing around without any great strength of their asset base, without any obvious unique selling point in a commodity business, they just didn't really justify their own existence. And so that quite naturally has been a major consolidation trend. The scale to which it was needed is, you know, somewhat perversely underlined by the fact that all these deals have been done at very low premiums. You know, we, apart from Oxy buying the private Crown Quest, we really haven't seen a, a decent premium, which would be more than 5% premium paid for by an acquirer for the company it takes over. So it's been overwhelmingly positive for the Chevron's Exxons that are doing the big deals because the prices they're getting Chevron, not just for Hess, which was considered a cheap price for the quality of Hess's assets, but also um, PDCE in Colorado was a very cheap deal for them. Excuse me, Denbury for Exxon was cheap. And, and above all, uh, Chevron at the bottom for Noble got a huge position in East, in East Med for a steal. So, you know, all of these things are just strengthening the big oils, but we can't seem to get any investor interest in them because everyone wants to buy AI. And we can't really fight that either because AI is doing its own thing pretty spectacularly. And it's hard to turn around and say, you know, wouldn't you prefer to own an oil company? Because it's, you know, the market will continue to want to buy the future and the, whatever, however well these companies are doing, they're not considered to be a, a must own part of our future, unfortunately, for them. The fact that these large oil companies can do these deals at a low valuation, so they basically can buy the entire company, the company they're, they're buying at at the market or even you know 5% premium, which is not a high premium, that's bullish for those large cap companies. But I imagine it's, it's not good for the companies who are being acquired because if mid cap or small cap company A got acquired for no premium at all, then mid cap company pre B, you know, it's hard to put a premium on, the, on that too. What, what's your outlook on the mid cap and small cap exploration and production EMP companies? By the way, there is a negative, further negative to the to the low premiums, which is that typically the CEOs have a change of control provision, which clips them a 10 or 15 or 20 or even $50 million payout. So one of the unfortunate things about this M&A trend has been that the CEOs have been getting rich, but the shareholders haven't. And that, again, does nothing for people wanting to own oil stocks. For the mid-caps, there's definitely some names, Devon, Aventiv, Marathon Oil, that really have to do something to change their position in, in the pecking order. Because what we're seeing very clearly is the biggest companies with the best inventory are getting the best multiples. And as long as there's question marks over multiple business mix, cash returns, ultimately inventory above all, because obviously the bigger the inventory, the more sustainable the company, the longer the cash return, the higher the capitalized price, the higher the share price, which would be the classic example of that would be Hess. What you're seeing here is with fear over future inventory and with high decline rates in US oil, nobody wants to own that middle rank. And then unfortunately, actually, once you get below $5 billion companies, there's almost no interest amongst serious investors in oil right now. So as I say, I'm hoping that we're doing this podcast uh, more that we bottom tick oil and top tick AI than I am from current major interest from your from your listeners in oil. But oil is always important. And you know, the fact of the matter is the US industry is doing very well, and is consolidating very hard. At the moment, cash returns are so strong amongst almost any of these names, including the mid caps, that they're approaching over 10% annually. And if they sustain that, which I think they can, that is to say the dividend plus the buyback equals more than 10% yield annually. Essentially, if you own an oil stock, you own it outright. Your basis is returned to you. You have a capital return in excess of the share price within eight years. And so you would end up owning a, an option on oil in year eight that I think is highly valuable. And it's not you know, insignificant that Warren Buffett's been buying a lot of Oxy and is now today everyone's mentioning that he's buying more Chevron. Uh, you know, For the long-term investor, this is a great opportunity in big oil. 
it's not a great trading call, but it's it's a great investment call for sure, in my opinion. And I've got Warren Buffett on my side. <laughs> yeah, you've got to have on your side. I think he's trimming Apple by just a little bit. Um, maybe he's selling a little Apple to buy Chevron. Not, not of course. Yeah, Apple, Apple's buy. interesting. We published these charts of oil, oil share of the S and P and oil share of the earnings of the S and P, and we're at about seven or eight percent of the earnings of the S and P and about three or four percent of the market cap. So we're obviously, by definition, at a very discounted multiple. Apple's interesting simply because its share of the earnings of the S and P is unchanged since 2016. You know, it's had no earnings growth relative to the market for what is that, seven, eight years. But its share of the market cap of the S&P has gone quite up a lot. So essentially, the, the stock has been moving entirely on multiple expansion. And that can't continue forever. So I think, you know, with no growth in earnings and with a high multiple, I would be selling Apple alongside Warren. <laughs> Depending on what you think of the headset. I don't know if I can't see myself wearing the headset. Paul, you brought up three important concepts. One is business mix. Two is inventory and three is cash return that I think are really important. And I'd love for you to explain them. And also maybe later we can explain why those three uh, uh, factors affect why oil sometimes gets a less, you know, lo lower valuation than NVIDIA. And in most cases we can agree, you know, oil should not get a 30 price to earnings multiple that Apple has. So for example, if someone pitches to you, which I'm sure you get so every now and then say, hey, there's this oil company up in Canada, and it's got a 60 free cash flow yield. Someone who doesn't know as much as you might say, how can I lose a 60% free cash flow yield in, low, in less than two years, I'm going to make more than my money back. What are they missing? And how can the three factors of business mix, inventory and cash return explain that? Yeah, so basically, I mean, you know, it's a commodity market. So it, it all depends, you know, obviously on oil and gas prices, ultimately, refining's just a volatile variation of that, because it's the difference between product prices and, and crude prices that makes them money, which is just double volatile. On the oil price, you know, we've, we've, we've covered the fact that essentially, it's hard to see why it will go up a huge amount when uh, Saudi has spare capacity. The market doesn't like it anyway when oil goes up a lot because high prices cure high prices. So if you look at, for example, the XLE ETF, which is the big oil ETF, it's never been above 100 and it happens to correlate quite closely to oil prices. So, you know, it's essentially it will never discount above $100 oil. And that's because essentially high prices will crush demand eventually and, you know, it will all go back down again. So we're really looking for what the mid cycle range is on oil as opposed to, oh, I think we're going to 120. Now, obviously, if you go to $120 a barrel, the market will, go, the wider market will go down and oils will outperform. But you will not capitalize, you know, the last part of that move. And if anything, people will use it as a reason to sell the oils. So the commodity is already tough in itself. Secondly, the you have a, you have an ultimate recoverable reserve, which is a very debatable number, but there's a finite amount of oil. And oil, when you start producing it naturally declines immediately. So you have to constantly replenish inventory, which means you have to constantly spend capex. And there's a Arguably no intellectual capital. It's not like the Apple headset or, um, you know, it's, it's something else that's very unique, a, a NVIDIA chip, which is very unique to NVIDIA, which essentially becomes a monopoly. The oil is oil, you know, so that, and, and the technology of producing it becomes very commoditized too, because the service companies essentially s uh, share best practice. So you're left with the quality of your rock, which is your inventory which the Permian is really good. Guyana is really good. We know what is good. The best Permian is outstanding. Guyana is outstanding. Um, and then it's a question of who owns that acreage. And, you know, ultimately what we like is, is focus on that, you know. So, for example, Diamondback is based in Midland. That's a big reason why Endeavor sold to them because Endeavor wanted to remain in Midland as a headquarters. And, you know, ultimately is purely focused on the Permian. So we know exactly what we're owning as opposed to a mixed business model where you're more subject to the vagaries of the difference between Texas and North Dakota and East Texas, the Eagleford. Uh, ultimately, also, the infantry in the Eagleford is a, a, mow, a one mowing operation. That is to say, you don't have benches of infantry, whereas in the Permian, you have layers and layers of infantry, which makes it a very deep infantry place to, to, to the preferable place to be in global oil, essentially, because you're also adjacent to global refining the biggest global refining center, which is the Gulf Coast. And so it's a question of just working out who's got the best of that. And we kind of know that Chevron 
Exxon Diamondback have that position, and then it's a question of if they're trading at too great a premium. And some of the other guys clearly, you know, have a much more limited inventory life, and they trade much less well. And that's where you get companies with very high free cash flow yields because it's not a sustainable free cash flow yield. And all of this boils down to essentially trying to parse through the financials and the geology of all these various companies, which is not easy, but is fairly well known by the market. Uh, you have an additional issue, which is you know management, <laughs> because obviously in a commoditized business, you've got to have good management. That's the major differentiating factor. Uh, you know, we've always said you don't buy good oil companies and you don't buy cheap oil companies and sell expensive ones. You buy good management, and so some of these companies with excellent CEOs like Mike Worth at Chevron, um, Diamondback with with the management combination there. Um, you know, these are just very, very well companies, well run companies that get it very well. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, I guess you, you would talk about the strategy and, you know, what are they going to do? And we are just trying to enforce on these companies that they have to just prioritize returns in a low growth business. That's the differentiating factor. And the cherry on the cake is cash return to shareholders, which is, you know, really to generate a yield to investors is the, the really the bull argument for owning an oil stock. And I think these yields are good. You know, I think the getting towards a 10% yield, which, for example, is almost the entire refining sector offers that now, is a very good return. It's not as whiz bang as AI, but it's probably a lot more sustainable. And Paul, we say a 10% cash return, the cash return is buybacks and dividends. Yeah. And is, is that relative to the market cap of the company relative to the equity value, your return on equity? How exactly. You, how you... So basically all you do is you just say, okay, this company pays out a uh, dollar dividend a year. Um, that's obviously the yield on the market cap. So basically, you know, if you have a hundred dollar market cap, I'm going to screw up the math now, um, but you get the idea. So it's very simple. The, the dividend yield is a well-published number, publicized number. The buyback yield is more complicated. Essentially, what you're doing is is talking about how many billions of dollars of buyback happen a year, and then if you, it becomes exa- it's theoretically the same as a as a dividend. You know, it's just a question of how many billion dividend, how many billion buyback. That combined yield becomes the cash return total. Now, of course, portfolio managers, anyone finds it much more difficult to show how much the buyback yield is because. It's subject to board approval. You know, it may change with the oil price and everything else. But if you look at the Chevrons, the Exxons, um, they have quite specific guidance for the coming year on how much they plan. In fact, for longer on how much buyback they plan to to to, to undertake. And in almost any scenario, they will do that. And so we can consider that that cash return to be yield, um, even though people would prefer dividend. It's still significant. And if you look at a company like Marathon Petroleum, the refiner, or Marathon Oil, the upstream company, um, they've both reduced their share count by upwards of 20% over the past two or three years. So, you know, it's a real material return to shareholders. Obviously, if every if the share count is reduced by 20%, you own effectively 20% more of the company. And that becomes your return. It's a little bit involved, but I hope you understand. So that point about inventory is so key. Is it fair to say that a company that has a long life inventory has a more certain future and therefore a buyback makes the rest of the shares that aren't bought back more valuable? That will be accretive to the business because, you know, what about a business that their inventory is two years and they buy back, you know, 90% of their stock, but the rest of the 10% of the stock, what does it own if after two years, what do they own? Nothing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's why tr- the, by far the highest multiple stock of the past two or three years has been Hess because of its Guyana position. You know, you'll see that Diamondback with its Permian position has a very, uh, has a relatively high multiple. And then the bigger guys have higher multiple because they have deeper inventory across more, across more uh, basins, whether it's Exxon with the combination of Permian and Guyana, Chevron with a combination of Permian and Kazakhstan, but also now Guyana when they buy Hess. Yeah, you have high conviction. These companies are also uh, dividend royalty, do they call it? Both of them have more than 25% year, 25 years of rising dividend. Both of them are in the royalty category. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a question of how much inventory is to how sustainable it is. And, and a wider market way of looking at it is that you know you see companies with 15% yields or 20% yields on dividend. 
the natural assumption is the dividend's going to be cut. <laughs> so, you know, that that's why if you see Exxon at a 10% yield or something, which you did in COVID, you buy it because it, it won't stay there because the, the, the yield is fundamentally sustainable given the balance sheet. But yeah, you're right. The toughest question is how much oil do these companies have and how long will it last? You know, it's actually quite difficult to work out because under SEC definition, you only have to publish your proven reserves, which is 90% chance of being in place. We tend to trade the stocks at proven and probable reserves, which is, you know, a more re realistic outlook for the company. And that 2P number, which is proven and probable, um, is much more debatable and, and, you know, much tougher to know what the true number is because essentially the companies don't officially report it. At certain consultancies like Wood McKenzie that I used to work for will give you a 2P number if you pay them a lot of money. Uh, but it's still debatable. It, it ultimately sets the, the valuation. And, and Hess was very much a, a deal that traded on the company's proven and probable reserves in Guyana, which are, are a good 20 years of inventory of very high quality, low, low carbon intensity oil. So which companies would you say have the strongest inventory positions? You mentioned a few of them. And which of them would you say have the weakest positions? I think that the, the market is definitely concerned about Devon, about Marathon Oil, and this is really the length of inventory. Now, the companies, of course, will, will counter by saying the market's wrong. But what, what's being discounted in the stocks, if you look at a Vintiv, if you look at Apache, um, none of these are perceived to have a tremendous depth of inventory. And you can see that more or less in the multiples. Um, you know, the, 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 the perming, the unconventional play is not about sending a drill ship into deep water and finding a spectacular bonanza of oil. You know, it's 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 a it's a grind, it's a, a ground and pound type operation. So the oil is more or less known to be in place, and therefore you're also looking for companies that have very low operating costs. So if you look at a company like um, like Diamondback, it leads on low operation, low low cost to actually produce this oil, which where there's less controversy in the Permian over whether the oil is actually in place. Pioneer is another good example of a company with a very deep inventory that, that sold for a good price. And of course, as you know, essentially the inventory is being scooped up at good prices by the biggest oils. So Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, uh, Diamondback in the case of Permian Specific are coming through as the major winners of this, of this uh, consolidation round. And, and those are actually the guys that we like. We, we really struggle to, to calculate the best way for some of the other inventory challenge companies to to do good deals that are that are good for shareholders. Uh, for example, Devon is rumored to be buying, according to Reuters, Anna Plus in the Bakken. Our argument is the opposite, that Devon should actually sell everything it has apart from the Permian. Because if you look at its valuation, and this gives you an illustration of the inventory problem, uh, Devon's position in the Permian is about the same as Diamondback's. Its enterprise value is about the same as Diamondback's. The only problem is that Devon has another 250,000 around barrels a day of oil production, which clearly the market's giving no value to at all. Now, that either means buy Devon or it means, you know, the market is never going to reward you for a dispersed position in multiple basins of questionable inventory depth. And Devon would be better selling those out and focusing on the Permian uh, is our strategy for the company. We don't think they're going to do this, actually, I have to say, but we think that's what they should do. Some, some deals have been announced but haven't closed yet. Like I'm looking at Exxon is going to buy Pioneer. They've announced it. And at $253 a share, but PXD, the price, Pioneer, is at $230 a share. So you know if you know the deal is going to close, it has some merger ARB. And I guess the, the profit, the reward of that merger ARB is, is the risk that the deal doesn't go through. Do you have a view on how many of these deals, like what, what are the odds that they're going to close yeah, no, it's, it's it's the number one question we're getting at the moment is is from Mojo Rob shops because you know I don't I don't know if it's rude, being rude to Mojo Rob's but it's a bit a bit of the old uh, picking up pennies in front of a steamroller you know Mojo Rob the, the the one that people are attracted to at the moment is Chevron Hess because that is you know according to the Mojo Rob guys like a twenty percent return but of course it's it's a series of moving targets firstly does the deal get approved. Does Maduro invade Guyana? You know, these are questions that, believe me, these guys get very focused on when you're in, you know, you, you really do focus on the speed of the steamroller when you're picking up pennies in front of it. It's about, let's say, over the next six months that Chevron, you know, which has a very fixed, I mean, these, these deals have fixed ratios of, of the number of shares of Chevron you're going to receive. 
And the only thing you the only thing you need to worry about apart from that, and it makes it sound easy, is Chevron's dividend. Chevron actually went X dividend today. So there's probably one more dividend payment that you have to account for. And if you want to be long Hess short Chevron, and believe me, I have clients who are doing that in size. The risk is obviously that the number one risk that you would be concerned about is the FTC. FTC is controversial. Most of the Wall Street chatter surrounds uh, Microsoft's perceived victory over the FTC and the Activision deal. And so it's seen that the FTC, which was thought to be sort of a major uh, horseman of the Biden administration in terms of, you know, Lena Khan, the young uh, British head of the FTC, was seen to be, you know, potentially somebody that was going to shake up major industries, notably tech. Uh, doesn't seem to have had the success, nor the success particularly in court, that people anticipated. They also agreed to EQT buying Tug Hill in the Marcellus space, which was seen as quite controversial from a competition point of view, just because you were consolidating two major positions in, in the Marcellus that you know could have been perceived to be anti-competitive. That deal got approved. So on balance... I think the market is quite hopeful that the FTC, although it's gone into a second round of um, reporting requirements from the companies on the deal, uh, in both cases, Exxon, Chevron, very confident that they're going to be approved. Uh, the CEO of she Exxon said the other day to us, uh, basically because the data supports it, there isn't a problem with with competition in these in these basins um, is the widely perceived uh, position. And the same applies to Southwestern for Chesapeake, Chesapeake for Southwestern, I should say. And also, which is quite a consolidation, Diamondback for, um, uh, for Endeavor. So essentially, we're hopeful that the FTC is going to wave these through. We also think because it's become so politicized, and it's a tragedy, frankly, that the FTC and the EPA are now more or less openly politicized. It's a real it's a real shame. Um, I mean, they shouldn't be, but they are. You know, this year we doubt that the FTC is going to want to do anything that affects oil prices too much. And Exxon and Chevron, particularly, have been at pains to say, as particularly in the case of Exxon, that in fact they're going to accelerate the growth of Pioneer um, in combination with Exxon, as opposed to cutting activity. And I think they're doing that quite deliberately in order to get approval. But essentially, you know, anything that risks oil prices in an election year is going to be of concern to the Biden administration, and and therefore, I think these deals will all be approved. The wild card is is Maduro in Venezuela, just because it's such a wild card, and I I could spend an hour talking about this. But I've been saying to clients, you know, the problem is I've, I I talk about it for ten minutes, and then I feel like I've added no value, because essentially you're you're dealing with you know a guy that shouldn't be in power, should probably be in jail, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, what he does next is extremely unpredictable, but he's certainly upsetting the US because essentially they're desperate for Venezuela to hold free and fair elections. And he has made a deal to do that. And he isn't upholding that. And part of whatever he's doing to the opposition, which is the first negative, also involves him saber rattling towards Guyana, which is making everyone distinctly nervous. The fact of the matter is that, you know, with Exxon, potentially Chevron and, and the Chinese being the three partners in Guyana, and with all of the world, including Cuba, believe it or not, telling Maduro not to get involved in invading Guyana, uh, and with the Venezuelan Navy not being, you know, one of the world's most powerful fighting forces, to say the least, and with there being no roads in the area where, where uh, Guyana borders Venezuela, on, the logical thing is to assume that nothing happens. And Exxon has described the risk as one on a scale of one to 10, where one is the least risk. But the merger ARBs are worried that that Maduro can still do something stupid and that that headline will blow out the spread. And that's we're trying to second guess a madman, essentially. So it's it's a tough one. Um, but but that there's a tremendous amount of interest around that from that point of view, Jack. Crypto's premier institutional event, the Digital Asset Summit from March 18th to March 20th, approaches rapidly. If you're planning on attending with a team in London, you might want to check out our general admission four-pack. It's the most cost-effective option if you're looking to maximize your company's footprint at this event. For four tickets, it's just £2,500, a 10% discount. And then if you use my code FG10, you get an additional £569 off. 
Click the link in the description to learn more, use code FG10, and grab three colleagues and head to the world's leading institutional crypto gathering. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. Okay, so a lot of interesting happening on the deal front. Paul, now let's move on to AI and its impact on energy demand. What has happened with power and electricity demand in the US over the past few years? How do you think this you know, huge AI revolution, uh, the merits of which will remain to be seen, but there's no doubt that a lot of investment is going uh, toward that activity. Uh, how is that going to impact power generation and how does that impact your world, oil, gas, everything else? Well, it's gas demand for us. You know that that's the key offsetting fuel. Natural gas demand is the key. Gas demand is the key offsetting fuel to the variability of solar and wind. And you've had an incredible boom in in solar and and wind capacity additions across the U.S. At the same time, uh, over the past let's say twenty years or so, U.S. has done a great job of growing its economy with with really flat, if not declining, electricity demand. And that's just been some very positive things, notably more efficient refrigerators, uh, generally more efficiency across everything that uses a lot of power, actually. So the utilities, which are pretty dopey, quite frankly, because they're sort of state-run regulated monopolies, uh, you know, it's a long argument between state governments and, you know, some utility that, that about, you know, capacity addition requirements and everything else in a very flat demand environment. It's been deeply boring, quite frankly. And, you know, the stocks, as you know, basically trade on their yield relative to the T-bill, which is a totally different subject. But more recently, what you've seen is the emergence and what really caught my eye is Dominion's uh, electricity demand forecast for Virginia. And what happened is essentially about six months ago, Dominion, which is the local utility more or less quintupled their electricity demand forecast, which, as I say, has not been the pattern for 20 years that you suddenly say, actually, electricity demand is growing super fast. And the reason for that is that Virginia is the number one data center market in the world, bar none. It's the most connected. It has four major connections to global internet, cross-Atlantic. Uh, it, it dominates data center locations with Data Center Alley in Loudoun County, Loudoun County is the richest county in the U.S., so it's been incredibly positive for the local economy. And these things are essentially power hogs, which hasn't been that great an issue uh, because you've had excess power capacity and you've been adding renewables. The issue is that renewables are, are, are variable, interrupting. You know, they, they get interrupted by lack of wind or nighttime in the case of solar. There's no baseload scale battery yet that can really handle uh, an entire electricity system through battery storage. That's kind of the holy grail of power. And it, it remains the holy grail to get a, a baseload level sort of nuclear plant sized battery is a long way away. And at the same time, this demand growth essentially is putting a lot of pressure on electricity systems. And we've seen this particularly in Texas, as I'm sure you're aware, where you've also had a combination of more volatile weather. Um, really affecting uh, power supply uh, negatively at times with huge freezing storms that are unusual, to say the least, for Texas, causing all sorts of drama in supplying power to, to Texans. And that gets them very upset because they actually have their own unique grid in Texas, ERCOT, the Electricity Reliability Council of Texas, to manage their own power system, which has seen stunning growth in, in wind and solar additions, but then actual reliability issues when when there was a major freeze. And on top of that, the scale of the economic growth in Texas is presenting issues. The line that we came up with in the note, Jack, which I think a lot of people were interested by, is that these N100 chips of, of NVIDIA um, use 700 watts, which is each chip consumes about the same amount of power as a house. And they've sold a couple of million of them so what you're saying is, wow, you've just kind of added Phoenix to the to the to the implicit electricity demand of, of of the U.S. just based on the fact that all these chips presumably are going to get used and they are power hogs, and that's what's driving the massive increase in Dominion's power uh, demand forecast, which it now has to address in a very bureaucratic local government uh, kind of challenge way. Combined, of course, with very rich people, as we always say, environmentalism is a luxury. Rich people suddenly turn around and get lawyers and say, we oppose this transmission line. We oppose any new power generation capacity. So it becomes very tangled trying to add the capacity that's necessary. 
And we're just highlighting that it's probably underestimated how flat US electricity demand has been for the last 20 years and how much it can grow over the next 20 years based on what's happening with AI. Uh, and that's the long and short of it. Incidentally, someone on Twitter, further to my calculation, that each chip uses the same as a household, and they've sold millions. Each chip also uses approximately the same as an EV for a year. So you're effectively adding a couple of million EVs, if you want to look at it that way, through these just these, these NVIDIA chips alone. And that's just going to be very interesting, and we'll see if electricity reliability can hold up. I checked in with a friend of mine and former colleague, Steve Fleischman, who's the number one utility analyst on Wall Street and has been for 20 years. And he's agreed. I mean, he was like, yeah, you're not crazy. Essentially, the utilities are struggling to supply enough power now. And whether or not Virginia can seriously meet its power demand forecasts um, is a very questionable. And they certainly can't meet it with, with wind. They're adding a huge offshore wind facility, but they can't, add, they can't meet that baseload demand with wind and solar alone. And so implicitly, there's tremendous growth, up to nine gigawatts of power to be added in Virginia alone in natural gas fired power. And so, you know, it becomes a very big story for, for US natural gas demand to meet all this power demand. And that my friend is the story. Paul, it's been great getting you on to talk about everything in the oil business. Thank you so much. People can find you on Twitter with the great handle at crude gusher. Where can people find your research at uh, Sankey research and tell us about the type of uh, services you offer your clients? Yeah, so we're, we're independent research. We, we love the subjects. We write about everything energy, but focus on oil and oil equities. But anything that gets our interest, we can write about. And so it's Sankey Research, sankeyresearch.com, Paul at sankeyresearch.com, any variation of those. And, you know, we're, we're always keen to enjoy uh, new clients. So please feel free to reach out for me. And I appreciate, Jack, you do a great job with these podcasts. And I'm honored that you would uh, take time to have an oil person on knowing that it's not the most fashionable subject right now. But thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Paul. But I, I don't want to be one of those guys who, you know, I, I only have an oil specialist when it's at 120 or 20. You know, you got to do a little bit, bit of balance. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story very quickly. I was when oil hit the peak just before the Ukraine invasion, I was standing underneath my jacket with my jacket over my head in the street in Brooklyn because CNBC Asia were desperate to get an oil analyst on to make a comment before the Tokyo Open. And as I was standing out in the street and to CNBC Tokyo's yelling and everything else, I was like, this must be a near-term top in oil. So yeah, you're, you're, you're doing it at a good counter-cyclical time in terms of the interest in the sector right now from generalists. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.